Hello everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today we're not going to be covering vintage technology all that much, but uh, rather um, uh, continuing a series on a home... Oh god. Oh. <laughs> Hello everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today we're not going to be so much looking at a piece of vintage technology as wrapping up a series I have rather inadvertently been making over the past little while on home fire alarms. Now, in previous videos, we've had a look at various mechanical heat-activated fire alarms, as well as both photoelectric and ionization smoke detectors. And while the latter are more sensitive and give greater warning of a fire than the former, there are various low-oxygen smoldering combustion processes that don't actually produce all that much smoke, but do produce a large amount of carbon monoxide, which can build up to dangerous levels before the smoke, if any, gets dense enough to set off a smoke detector, which is why it's important to install in your house both smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors like this one. And this is the technology that we'll be looking at today. Now, carbon monoxide is particularly insidious because it is colorless, odorless, and it binds preferentially with hemoglobin, the molecule in the blood that carries oxygen around the body. And so it replaces oxygen and suffocates the body from the inside. And this can happen at very low concentrations. Indeed, nine parts per million or ppm of CO is the maximum threshold for long-term exposure. At concentrations of 200 ppm and above, CO can cause various symptoms including nausea, confusion, headaches, and unconsciousness, and kill within hours, while at concentrations of 800 ppm and above, it can kill within minutes. At even higher concentrations, it can even kill within seconds. Indeed, during the Pacific Theater of the Second World War, when U.S. troops would use flamethrowers to clear out Japanese bunkers, they would often enter the bunkers afterwards and find the occupants dead, but untouched by any flames. And this is because the flamethrowers produced so much carbon monoxide that one lungful was enough to kill a Japanese soldier instantly. In a more domestic setting, carbon monoxide poisoning commonly occurs when people try to operate engines, generators, camp stoves, barbecues, space heaters, things like that in confined spaces. And it used to be a lot more common because the illuminating gas, aka coal gas or town gas that used to be supplied for lighting, heating, and cooking was mainly composed of carbon monoxide, which is flammable, the rest being hydrogen and methane. And this is the origin of the old cliche of people sticking their heads in gas stoves in order to commit suicide. And of course, there are countless instances of lighting fixtures and stove burners going out and flooding houses with deadly gas. And finally, carbon monoxide is a huge concern in many industrial environments, especially in coal mines, or it was traditionally known as white damp. And if you want to learn more about mining damps and the various traditional methods of detecting and protecting against them, please check out my previous videos on mining safety lamps and the MSA All Service Gas Mask, links as always in the description. Now, given the extreme danger that it poses, there has, of course, long been a need for methods of detecting carbon monoxide before it reaches dangerous concentrations. Now, traditionally, as I've covered in previous videos, this was done using flame safety lamps and small animals like mice and canaries. But of course, these were non-specific tests. They could react to a whole bunch of different toxic, asphyxiating, or flammable gases. But the first specific tests for carbon monoxide didn't appear until the 1920s, and these were chemical tests based on various compounds of palladium such as palladium sulfite and palladium chloride. These are reduced by carbon monoxide to elemental palladium, causing their color to change from yellow to dark brown. Some early patents for such detectors I've been able to dig up include this one, filed in 1925 by AT&T employees Chester Gordon and James Lowe, where the reagent, mixed with water, sodium chloride, and acetone, is sealed inside a glass ampule surrounded by an absorbent cloth wrapper. To use this device, the operator would crush the ampule so the reagent soaked into the wrapper, then place it inside a sampling tube with an aspirator bulb, which you would then use to draw air over the reagent. A later variation of this design is this one from 1951, patented by John Mainsmith and Alan Irwicker, in which the palladium sulfate reagent is instead suspended in a silica gel chromatography substrate. These detectors were mainly used for testing the air in confined spaces, such as the manholes for electrical and communications cable trunks, before sending workers in. 
though later cheap monitoring badges, rather like the decimeters used for measuring radiation exposure, were also developed for workers working in high CO environments. However, being purely visual, such detectors could not give any auditory warning of rising CO levels. But the first electronic CO detectors for use in industry didn't start appearing until the 1980s, while the first home version didn't appear until 1993, released by BRK Electronics Incorporated, which, as I've covered in previous videos, also released one of the first successful household ionization smoke detectors, the first alert, in 1969. And in anticipation of the 1993 release, in 1992, the Underwriters Laboratory published standard UL2034, which, among other things, laid out the concentration thresholds at which CO alarms must sound and required that CO alarms must be able to distinguish between CO and other common gases like methane, aka natural gas, and carbon and dioxide. Now, depending on the model and the application, CO detectors work according to a variety of different principles, with the most common sensor type being the electrochemical, which is what we have inside this particular CO alarm. Now, interestingly, I wasn't actually planning on covering this topic anytime soon, but I just so happened to come across this expired CO alarm in the trash, and so I thought, no time but present. So let's have a look inside and let me show you how this works. If we remove the cover, we can see our main components, a transformer to step down the 120 volt AC from the mains to the voltages needed to run the circuitry, a siren horn or speaker, a detector circuit, and our sensor chamber. So if I remove the chamber, which requires desoldering it from the circuit board, you can see that one end is covered over with a little bag of silica gel desiccant to prevent moisture from getting inside. If I remove this, we see one of two electrodes, one connected to the body of the chamber itself, and the other to a plate at the other end electrically isolated from the chamber by this rubber o-ring. Now all this is crimped shut and not at all intended to be disassembled and so it takes quite a bit of work with pliers to pry apart. But this is the final result. Just a hollow canister with two electrodes, an end cap with a tiny pinhole to let air in, and a number of gaskets to keep everything sealed up and electrically isolated. Not pictured is the liquid electrolyte, dilute sulfuric acid, filling the interior. And that's really all there is. Now this is considerably simpler than the standard sensor design that you're likely to find in the literature. That design comprises a chamber filled with electrolyte, again typically dilute sulfuric acid, fitted with three electrodes, the working electrode, reference electrode, and counter electrode, and closed at one end by a Teflon membrane only permeable to the specific gas being detected, in this case carbon monoxide. CO in the air diffuses through the membrane, dissolves in the electrolyte, and migrates to the platinum working electrode, which catalyzes the reduction of CO to CO2. This process generates electrons which flow out of the working electrode, generating an electrical current proportional to the carbon monoxide concentration in the air, which can be measured by a detection circuit. Meanwhile, the reference electrode maintains the electrical bias potential needed to maintain the reduction reaction, while the counter electrode completes the other half of the electrolytic cell. However, according to this 2003 patent from KIDA, the manufacturer of this particular carbon monoxide detector, they managed to considerably simplify this design by replacing the platinum electrodes with carbon versions in the form of carbon impregnated PTFE or Teflon, these black washers here. Now, according to this patent, this is meant to be used in conjunction with a carbon monoxide generator of similar design that allows the detector to self-calibrate. Of course, that doesn't appear to be the case here, and I've not been able to determine just how this implementation differs from the original patented design. But if any of you out there know more about this, please let me know. Now, not only are electrochemical detectors very sensitive, with a detection threshold of around 0.1 to 100 parts per million, but they're also inexpensive, consume very little power, and can last up to five years before requiring replacement. Now, another type of CO detector, which was actually developed a little bit before the electrochemical type, is the biomimetic sensor, which, as the name implies, mimics the binding of CO with hemoglobin in the blood of living organisms. Now, these are fundamentally based on the same palladium reduction reaction as the old chemical detectors from the 1920s. However, a number of other chemical components are added so that when the detector is removed to a CO-free environment, the reaction actually reverses and the sensor resets. Specifically, in addition to palladium compounds, these detectors will contain molybdenum salts like molybdenum trioxide or ammonium molybdate, copper salts like copper sulfate or copper chloride, chloride salts like lithium or sodium chloride, and a substrate or encapsulant, typically alpha, beta, or gamma cyclodextrin. Newer versions being developed also use even more hemoglobin-like reagents like iron porphyrin on a substrate of carbon nanotubes. 
Now, in these detectors, the color or transparency of the reagent is constantly monitored by a light source and a photocell. And if either of these parameters changes by a certain threshold amount, then the alarm will be triggered. Now, while biomimetic sensors are more expensive than electrochemical sensors, they are false alarm free because they are designed to only react to the carbon monoxide molecule and not any other chemicals. And for this reason, they are often used in places like hospitals, laboratories, and nursing homes, where evacuating everybody for a false alarm would be prohibitively expensive or inconvenient. Now, a third type of carbon monoxide detector is the infrared or spectrometric type, where a beam of infrared light is shone across a certain space, and the device measures the degree to which that light is absorbed by the carbon monoxide in the intervening air. Now, while these are very sensitive and reliable, they are prone to false alarms triggered by various other gases, and also they tend to be very bulky and expensive due to the length of the light path needed. And so they are mainly relegated to industrial applications. And finally, the last type of carbon monoxide sensor in common use is the semiconductor type, which comprises an array of fine tin dioxide wires on an insulating silicon base, which is kept at a temperature of 400 degrees Celsius by resistance heating. And how this works is that oxygen will oxidize the wires, increasing the thickness of the oxide layer and increasing their resistance, whereas carbon monoxide will reduce the layer and decrease the resistance. So the current flowing through the wires is directly proportional to concentration of carbon monoxide in the atmosphere. Now, while such sensors have the advantage of greater longevity than electrochemical sensors around 10 years, they also consume far more power due to the electrical heating requirements and also have lower sensitivity around 50 to 200 parts per million lower threshold. But whatever sensor technology they use, most household carbon monoxide alarms are not designed to go off immediately at a certain threshold concentration. Rather, at around 70 parts per million, they might take up to an hour to go off, whereas at 400 parts per million or above, they might just take a few minutes or even a few seconds. And this is to prevent frequent false alarms from transient sources of carbon monoxide, such as from cigarettes or burning food. Anyway, that is a brief overview of the technology of carbon monoxide detectors, and thus ends, at least for the time being, my series on home fire alarms. Hope you found that interesting. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time on another video where we'll look at yet more fascinating safety equipment and other devices just like this. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Stay safe and have a great day.